For the longest time in the NFL, one of the age-old questions has been, what would you rather have? A quarterback who throws a lot of interceptions, but also gets a lot of yards and a lot of touchdowns? Or a quarterback who hardly throws any interceptions, but also hardly gets the ball downfield? Would you rather have a Brett Favre type player who's going to throw a lot of interceptions, but also get a lot of touchdowns? Or do you take an Alex Smith type player who definitely won't get the ball to the end zone as often, but also won't throw as many interceptions? There's one thing for sure, the worst thing a quarterback can do is throw an interception. However, an interception isn't always terrible. In fact, one time there was an interception that was actually amazing, and was thrown by a guy named John Forcade who played for the Saints. I think it's actually fair to say, this play just might be the oddest play in NFL history. It started off with Saints quarterback John Forcade throwing an interception, which isn't really too surprising. Forcade had a relatively short stint in the NFL. His career ended after just 4 seasons, and he ended up only starting 23 games in his career. So him making a mistake, nothing too out of the ordinary. However, there was one thing that made his interception very different than the others. So after the Rams intercept the ball, they're going to try to run it back, and this is close to halftime, so they really have to try to make sure they can get into the end zone. So what actually happens here is a pretty clear forward lateral, which you might be thinking, okay, that's an illegal play, right? However, this play took place in 1987 when it was actually legal to gain yards on a forward fumble as long as the referees decided it was accidental. So back in the 80s, sometimes in desperation situations, this is the kind of thing that teams would try to do. We can call this idea the oops I didn't mean to throw it to my wide open teammate downfield strategy. It worked this time. Rams defensive back Greg Williamson flipped it upfield to a defensive lineman who was able to gain a good amount of yards. Also on a bit of a side note, this was Greg Williamson's first and only career interception, which really adds to the whole craziness of this play. Also, you might notice I didn't mention that defensive lineman's name, and this is because I don't know what his name is. And that's not because I'm just being lazy and don't want to do the research to find out who it is. His number is clearly 98, however when I'm looking through the Saints roster from 1987 when this game took place, they had no player with the number 98. I checked on ProFootballDB.com and ProFootballReference.com, but there was no number 98 to be found. Perhaps this play was just so embarrassing he begged the NFL scorekeepers to scratch his name from the record books, or perhaps we're all living in a simulation and this was a glitch in the matrix. Anyways, this mystery lineman in inexplicably hurls the ball forward in a way that I would have thought was intentional if it didn't go directly to a Saints player. But not just any Saints player, it was John Forcade himself. The man who threw the initial interception ended up recovering it and running it all the way for a touchdown, 77 yards. John Forcade ended his career with 16 total touchdowns, 17 if you include this one. So that means that almost 6% of his total touchdowns throughout his career basically came when he was playing defense. Even more crazy about this play is 1987, the Saints defense didn't come up with a single touchdown. So this means that in 1987, the Saints had one defensive touchdown all year and it was by a quarterback. It's one of my favorite plays that's ever happened, however this isn't the only time this type of situation has happened to the Saints. If you fast forward a couple decades now with Drew Brees playing for the Saints, actually a very similar thing happened. This time it wasn't Drew Brees who ended up getting the fumble return for a touchdown, however it still kind of is pretty interesting that two different Saints quarterbacks have thrown interceptions that resulted in touchdowns for their team. I don't know what they're doing in New Orleans to get quarterbacks to throw interceptions that result in offensive touchdowns, but it's clearly working for them. So every now and then, an interception ends up being a great play, however, that's definitely few and far between. More often than not, an interception is the worst thing you can possibly do as a quarterback. But then of course the question becomes, well exactly how bad is it to throw an interception? For example, someone like Ben Roethlisberger actually led the league in passing yards last season, however he also led the league in interceptions. Meanwhile, someone like Aaron Rodgers threw for a very respectable, although not world beating, 4,442 yards, however he only threw two interceptions. So who's better, the guy who's going to throw for nearly 700 more yards, or the guy who's going to throw for 14 less interceptions? And the answer is, well it depends. First things first, not every interception is created equal. If you're at your opponent's 1 yard line and then throw a 100 yard pick 6, that's definitely a lot worse than if you're at your own 15 yard line and throw the ball 70 yards down the field which results in an interception in return for no gain. So the first thing I had to do in figuring out how badly an interception hurts a team is figuring out point expectancy for each point of the field that you're on. The first thing I did was record over 5,000 plays from the past 6 seasons. All I was looking for is what the situation they were in and then how many points they went on to score on that drive. So for example if the play was a second down and 7 at the opponent's 42 yard line and they scored 7 points, well then I would say they scored 7 points on that drive. I also purposely didn't record any plays from late in the first half or late in the game because due to strategy you might purposely do something different than you would in the middle of the first quarter for example. Like for example if you're down by 2 with 2 seconds left you might just kick a field goal even if it's first down. However in a more typical situation you'd be an insane person to kick a field goal on first down so that's why I didn't include those drives. Also worth mentioning the only reason why I only include plays from the past 6 seasons is just because of the fact that the game has become more and more high scoring every year so I totally throw off my data if I measured anything from too long ago. 
So after doing all that, I was able to get the average point expectancy for each situation, which you can see in the charts right here. Most of these are going to end up looking like the one on the right. The only reason why I only measured first down, second down, or third down when you're inside your own 10 is because, well, most of those situations are going to be the same. While you technically could have a third down and one at the 10 yard line, that situation is very rare because you'd have to start the ball at your own one yard line and then get nine yards, and those things are just incredibly uncommon. But basically what you'd see here is exactly what you would expect. I mean, on first down, you have a higher point expectancy. On second down, you have a lower point expectancy. And on third down, you have an even lower point expectancy. The one slight difference you'll notice, however, is that if it's a second down and one, two, or three, your point expectancy actually goes up from just any first down. This, of course, is because if you do have a second down and one, two, or three, the chances of you converting are so high that you'll probably end up with another first down further down the field. Although, interestingly, it's not that in every single one. I mean, if you move on to the next two sections of the field, as you see here, for example, as the data would suggest, if you're at your own 21 yard line and then gain nine yards, this would actually mean that that's a bad play because it lowers your point expectancy. However, I don't really think that's totally accurate. Not because I don't think the data is accurate, the data is accurate. However, what's worth mentioning here is that a lot of these drives are going to start at the 25 yard line. So while a point expectancy for a first down at the 25 yard line is 1.6, and that is a point in number that I will bring up in a moment, because a touchback automatically brings the ball up to the 25 yard line, this now means that the vast majority of those second down and one, second down and two, or second down and three situations have actually already been going on for a little bit of time, and of course the longer a drive goes on, the higher chance of something going wrong. Moving on to what's on the midfield, again, pretty basic, nothing really too fancy here. Point totals are still going up as you would expect, and you're actually almost at the point now where you're expected to get three points when you're in this situation. And you'll notice even more so when you skip ahead to the next two frames. I think typically as a fan, when you're watching your team be in a 30 to 39 yard line, typically you're saying, well, hey, I wouldn't hate a field goal here. However, when you have a first down inside the 39 yard line, you're actually expected to score more than four points. So a field goal would actually be a pretty big win from the defense. And that's kind of saying something, because even if you're at the 30, that still means a 47 yard field goal attempt, which is definitely no gimme. Also, one little weird wrinkle I noticed when I was going through this is take a look at the third down and 14 or more yards to go from the 29 to 20. So even though you are in decent field goal range, because the fact that it's so difficult to try to get a touchdown from that situation, and it actually can be somewhat common to turn the ball over in that situation, that's what gives it such a low point expectancy. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because that kickers last year made 97.93% of their field goal attempts from that area. Meaning if you were a team with a league average offense, it would actually make more sense to just kick the field goal in that situation than it would to actually try to convert on a play. Your point expectancy actually goes up in this situation from trying to kick a field goal on third down. And of course various things come into that, like if you have Tom Brady who you trust to not throw interceptions in that situation, well then you should still try to go for it. If you have a young quarterback who makes some bad decisions from time to time, then maybe you would be better off just kicking the field goal on third down and 15. Last but not least, moving on to the final two parts of the field, probably just the most interesting thing here is that on a first down and goal at the one, you're expected 6.05 points. Almost everywhere in this situation, you are expected to score more than 3 points, with the one small exception being 3rd down and 14 or more inside the 19 but outside the 10. One relatively fun thing I learned from reading through all this is it actually is possible to throw an interception that helps your team. And I'm not talking about a 4th down either. I mean, on a 3rd down, you can throw an interception that doesn't get fumbled and still is a good play for your team. Let's say you're a quarterback in the NFL and it's a 3rd down and 17 at your own 28 yard line. You throw a 55 yard pass that's intercepted and there's no gain on the interception return. When it's 3rd down and 14 from your own 21 to 30 yard line, you only projected to score 0.4 points. Meanwhile, now your opponent's drive is starting from their own 11 to their own 20, meaning that their point expectancy for this drive should be 1.13. But that actually doesn't mean that you cost your team 1.53 points. Because you're not actually giving your opponents an extra drive. I mean, if you threw a touchdown on that next play, the other team would still get an extra drive. And the average starting field position is from the 21 to 30 yard line, which puts you at 1.6 points. So losing that drive only costs you 0.4 points. However, it's going to cost them 0.47 points due to the field position. So this now means that because of the situation you were in, losing that drive but causing the field position to be poor actually benefits you. So now that I have this table, I wanted to see which quarterbacks throw the worst interceptions and which quarterbacks throw interceptions that aren't really that bad. So first things first, I took out each interception that was only due to a desperation type situation. For example, if someone threw an interception on a Hail Mary at the end of the half, I didn't include those into the list. Then I simply just used the point expectancy chart to figure out how badly each interception hurt each team, and then I figured out on average how badly does each player's interception hurt their team. So as you see right now, Josh Allen actually throws the best interceptions. He's great at throwing interceptions. Elite Joe Flacco is right behind him, and then Tom Brady's at three. Once again, Tom Brady getting beat by Joe Flacco. There seems to be some randomness and some, okay, well it makes sense that you're good at this going on. I mean, Patrick Mahomes and Phillip Rivers, Deshaun Watson, Carson Wentz, all those guys 
guys being good at throwing interceptions makes some sense. One thing you'll also see on this list is Jameis Winston at number 10, which is a little bit surprising because he does have a tendency to throw some really ugly interceptions. However, ugly interceptions don't always equate to the worst types of interceptions. In fact, Winston actually had the best pick 6 of the season. He was at his own 10 yard line and it was a 3rd down and 10, so even though it was a pick 6 and so you get 6.94 points, and yes it's 6.94 points, not a full 7 points, and the reason for that is simply because 6% of extra points are missed. He did give up that 6.94 points, however he was only projected to score 0 0.2 points when he was in his current situation. And again, because you're already given 1.6 points whenever you have a drive, this now means you have to subtract that out. Meaning despite it being a pick 6, it actually only cost his team 5.54 points. You can also look ahead towards the bottom part of the list. I mean, Matt Ryan is actually 34, which is a little bit surprisingly low. You'll also see Nathan Peterman at 35, which amazingly is actually going to be the highest he'll perform on any of these next lists I'll show you. You'll also see Alex Smith behind him, but that was largely just due to one bad interception. And also Russell Wilson, who is the worst in this category, mainly is there just because he threw two bad pick 6s. And that's kind of the key to this stat, is just avoiding those bad interceptions. This stat admittedly isn't the best, and I'm going to show some better ones in a second. But it's worth mentioning that while an average Russell Wilson interception during the 2018 season cost 4.86 points, he also only threw 7 interceptions. So despite his interceptions being a little bit worse than the average, that still doesn't mean that he was the worst guy at throwing interceptions. And speaking of the average interception, the title of this video is How Badly Does an Interception Hurt a Team? And I have the answer right now. It's 3.79 points. That's how badly an interception hurt a team. So that's kind of an interesting stat, but I think this next one will be a much better one. It's how many points on average did you lose per game in the 2018 season just by throwing interceptions? As you see right here, the top of the list is Aaron Rodgers, which makes a ton of sense. I mean, he only threw two interceptions all year, so obviously, no matter how bad his interceptions are, the chances are you're going to be very high on this list. The top of this list makes a ton of sense. It's a lot of guys who are known for taking care of the football. I mean, you got Aaron Rodgers, Drew Brees, Lamar Jackson, who just doesn't throw the ball a lot, so of course he's not going to lose many yards through the interceptions. You also got guys that keep getting called game managers and Dak Prescott and Alex Smith, and then probably the biggest surprise comes right there at number 7 with Joe Flacco. I mean, he's kind of become a meme at some point. I always refer to him as Elite Joe Flacco when I talk about him just because it's kind of funny. But he probably is a little bit underrated, and he is pretty good at taking care of the football. I won't go through each person on this list, but I will mention a couple of interesting things. One being that Russell Wilson actually ends up being 13 on this list. So even though he was the worst at throwing interceptions, only throwing 7 definitely made him pretty good on the list. Going down to the bottom 5, you got two San Francisco 49er quarterbacks and CJ Beathard and Jimmy Garoppolo. And of course, it wouldn't be a bottom 5 list if it wasn't for Nathan Peterman somewhere in that list. And now a lot of people might be saying, well, wait a second, isn't just just a lot of luck. I mean, no one wants to throw an interception, so isn't a lot of throwing an interception mostly just random? But I don't really think that's fair. Actually, one thing that I found pretty interesting is that the average interception only goes for 1.33 yards further down the field. Obviously, that doesn't mean that the average interception from the 50 yard line ends up at the 49 yard line because there's just so much variance in either direction. But I find it interesting that most interceptions basically cause no gain whatsoever. So, to try to figure out how much luck is in this and how much the quarterbacks actually have impact in this, I also decided to calculate every interception from the 2017 season. If we take a look at these two lists side by side, there definitely are some differences. One is how far back Aaron Rodgers was last year, and now he's not number one. Drew Brees is also at number nine, then was able to jump up to number two. One of the biggest differences was Deshaun Watson, who was one of the worst last season, jumps up all the way to number 4 this season. So while Watson's interception totals were way down, was he also just unlucky by throwing some bad interceptions last season? Well maybe, I mean that's certainly a possibility, but it's also a possibility that he just did a much better job of not throwing bad interceptions like he did last year. If you look at the bottom 3 on this list, you'll see some pretty ugly numbers. When I first saw that Ryan Fitzpatrick on average cost his team 6.92 points per game, I was like, oh my god, no way someone's gonna do worse than him. But there were actually two quarterbacks worse than him, and of course they both played for the Bills. Nathan Peterman cost his team 8 points just from interceptions every time he played the game, and Derek Anderson cost his team 8.99 points every time he played a game for the Bills. I want to change things up and not just do points lost due to interception per game, but also do points lost due to interception per attempt. Because there's so many quarterbacks who end up starting a game but not finishing it, or playing at the end of a game but not starting the game, I figured per attempt would actually give us a much more accurate depiction of each of these guys. So once again, it's going to be Aaron Rodgers at number 1, and then not too surprising, Drew Breeze is the one following him. Number 3 is surprising as Joe Flacco was somehow the third best at throwing interceptions per attempt. Further down the list, again, nothing really too surprising from this point on. You got Brady, Prescott, Goff, Watson, Mahomes, Ryan. All guys you expect to be pretty high up on this list. So again, this doesn't mean necessarily how good are you as a quarterback, but how good are you at protecting the football. So while all of those things are kind of interesting, none of them have answered my initial question. The whole point of this video is what would you rather have, a guy who throws more interceptions or a guy who moves the ball downfield more frequently? 
To figure that out, I had to find a way to combine the stat of passing yards with interceptions, and I actually think I did that pretty well. Since I now know how many points it costs a team to throw any select interception, I know how to figure out how many points do you gain from throwing a lot of passing yards. So to figure that out, I did the following. I found out that there was 174,362 total yards in 2018, and just for clarification, that's not just passing yards, but yards as a whole, and there was 11,952 total points in 2018. So just doing simple math, this now means that for every 14.5888520749 yards is equal to one point. So if you throw for roughly around 29 yards on one play, that actually equates to about two points. So what I did from here is figured out every quarterback's passing and rushing totals from 2018, and then I used this formula to figure out how many points did they add to their team. Now admittedly, this is a flawed stat for two particular reasons. The first of which is that the goal in football isn't just to get the ball as far down the field as possible, it's to get it into the end zone. So if you're a quarterback who thrives in the red zone, you won't actually get any added benefit from that using this stat, which is why it's a particularly flawed stat. Another reason is the fact that it's not taking fumbles into account. I could just implement fumbles into the system by just using the same formula I used for interceptions. However, the problem with that is a lot of fumbles are fluky and very random. There's a lot of times when a quarterback doesn't do anything wrong, but a left tackle just loses their one-on-one -on -one matchup and it results in a bad fumble. Of course, sometimes it is the quarterback's fault, and sometimes it's kind of a combination of both, which is why, once again, this is a flawed stat. There is no such thing as a perfect stat, especially in football when it is such a team game. But I find those flaws to be relatively minor flaws, and I think this stat will still go to serve the purpose that I'm trying to show here. So once I had the average points gained through passing and rushing yards by each quarterback, I then had to subtract the points lost from interceptions, and then I divided that total by each passing attempt to figure out how many points each player gained per attempt. From that, you see on the screen, once again, Aaron Rodgers is number one, which kind of goes to show how important it is to not turn the ball over. Also kind of crazy that Rodgers and Ryan are number one and two, and neither of their teams came even close to making it to the playoff. It would just go to show how much of a team sport football is. You also got Patrick Mahomes at number three, and some people might be saying, well, does this mean that he shouldn't have won MVP if he was number three and not number one here? And it could be debated, although he actually threw a lot more passing yards than both Rodgers and Ryan. So in an average game, he actually added 20.94 points per game, which was the highest in the NFL. So while he wasn't quite as efficient as those two top guys, he did actually add more value, so you could still make the argument that he should have won MVP. And Bears fans also probably won't be too happy to see Deshaun Watson one behind Patrick Mahomes. Of course, the Bears passed on both Mahomes and Watson to pick up Mitchell Trubisky. And Trubisky is a fine player, but it's definitely looking regrettable in hindsight. Maybe the biggest surprise on this entire list is Ryan Fitzpatrick is fifth highest on this list. Some of that probably just has to do with the fact that he had a very small sample size, so the first couple of games when he played so well kind of inflated those numbers a bit. But it is still pretty remarkable when you remember that he lost 6.92 points per game due to interceptions. You have Breeze and Wilson right behind, and a couple more surprises at the 8 and 9 situation. Eli Manning's at number 8, and I don't think that's actually too surprising, but it is a bit surprising. I mean, I did make a video talking about how I still think he can play in the NFL, even if he's not what he once was. But I do think a lot of where his blame comes from is just how bad the team has been, not necessarily how bad he's been personally. Also, Jameis Winston at number 9, and again, this one is a little bit surprising until you really start to think about it. I mean, he's definitely that gunslinger type quarterback who's definitely going to give up a lot of yards, but is also going to turn the ball over a ton. But it's also worth noting that the main reason everyone wrote him off last year was really due to one bad game against Cincinnati. He's played relatively fine outside of that one game, so he's definitely gotten unfair criticism in my opinion. Also kind of funny that Tampa Bay has two quarterbacks who are both in the top 10, and both of them are heavy gunslingers. So while Aaron Rodgers is number one for being a very cautious guy who can still move the ball down the field, some of these gunslingers are still getting pretty high on the list. And speaking of gunslingers, Ben Roethlisberger is sitting at number 10. The guy who led the league in interceptions is still number 10 because he led the league in passing yards as well. You also have guys like Marcus Mariota, Kirk Cousins, and Derek Carr who are right there in a mediocre range. And you also have Flacco at number 18, so even though he was so high on some of those lists of being able to protect the ball, he's not too high on this list because he doesn't get a ton of passing yards. You also have Garoppolo at 24, which seems a little bit low to me, however you have to keep in mind that he only played 3 games. Maybe the two biggest surprises would be Tom Brady at 27 and Andrew Luck at 31, however I think there's an explanation for those two as well. For Brady, while he definitely did have a much worse season than last year, a lot of the way the Patriots run their offense is a lot of short passes and try to have methodical drives down the field. That's why once again, there is no perfect stat, and in every stat you create, there is going to be some asterisks. However, I do think this is a pretty good stat. I just think in his case, he's going to be a little bit lower than he should be. And as for Andrew Luck, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, that guy just throws the ball a ton. He also did get off to a bit of a slow start early on, so it does make some sense that he is going to be a little bit low. While he is actually worse than Blake Bortles in this stat, that doesn't mean that he's worse overall. In terms of points per game, he gained 16.82 points per game, whereas Bortles only gains 12.74 points per game. 
I do like points gained per attempt better than points gained per game as a whole, just because I think that gives you more accuracy overall. However, there can be some flaws like in those situations. Last but not least, going on to the bottom five, Nick Foles is actually all the way back at 36, which is kind of surprising. It makes Philadelphia seem a little bit smarter now about hanging on to Carson Wentz, who's up there at 17. Once again, the bottom two guys are Derek Anderson and Nathan Peterman. However, look at Nathan Peterman. That's not a typo. On average, every time he threw the ball, he actually hurt his team 0.917 points. Per game, he actually cost his team 2.09 points. And also, kind of just as amazingly, last year, he actually had negative point totals as well, as he cost his team 0.84 points per game. I almost feel a little bit bad bringing this up, but I mean, the numbers are the numbers, and the numbers are just not good for Nathan Peterman. While Peterman definitely isn't great, I actually don't think he has the honor for most embarrassing moment in these past few seasons. I actually think that belongs to a different situation that most people will have forgotten about. Breaking down this play, the Chargers quarterback is actually not going to make a terrible decision. It's clearly man coverage and he has a receiver running a slant route, so that's where he's going to try to throw it to and it's a pretty decent idea. However, it's just a bad throw, it's nowhere near his intended target, and it's going to end up being intercepted for a 96 yard touchdown return. It's bad for sure, however there's only 3 minutes left in the game and they're already up 24 so it's not really that big of a deal. However what's really interesting about this play is who threw the pass. Since the Chargers had already locked up the game, this now means that they had taken out Phillip Rivers and put in their backup Kellen Clemens. An interception return for touchdown on a 3rd down and 2 at the 9 yard line cost your team 10.39 points. Clemens didn't play this last season, however the past 4 seasons he did play, he was a backup for the Chargers. In that time, he threw for 109 yards and rushed for a total of negative 2 yards. So that means that over the time span, he only gained 7.33 yards for his team. So this now means that in this one particular play, he actually hurt the Chargers more than he had helped them in the past half a decade. Thanks for watching that video, I had a lot of fun making this type of video, I know it's very different than my typical videos, but I figured I'd try to mix things up every now and then. If you're interested in seeing these tables again, I'm going to tweet them out at Jackson Kruger, and I'm also going to put them on my website at JacksonKrugerSports.com. So feel free to take a look at those, and as always, thanks a lot for watching.